ladies and gentlemen, Trigger, the gambler. A lot of people always thought my album got shelved at Def Jam. My, al my album never got shelved. I pulled my album. And all the guys would come to us, the Run DMCs, the, the Puff Daddy. The um the um the game dash all of them would come to us and sit down and get the game, get the game on how how to get the money from these record labels. Me and Smooth, you know, we we used to run into Pac a lot, and everybody knew who did it in New York, and that Biggie ain't have nothing to do with it. Everybody knew that. Wow, if you were from the streets, if you were from the streets out here. And you was in the mix, you knew who the fuck did this shit. I never spoke on this topic. I never spoke to no other um, radio station, no one, about this. About this. You are the first one. Thank you. Back to the beginning, my man. Um, I know you're from Brownsville. Um, tell us what it was like growing up in Brownsville, Brooklyn, back in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Well, New York, period. You know, it's a fast city. It's just fast and... Um, Brownsville, it's nice, nice area. Brooklyn, we grew up. It was rough, real rough. Can't I can't lie to you about that. Real rough. And um, me and Smooth on Saratoga Avenue, we grew up on that. What is it? Ocean Hill, Brownsville. That's between Brownsville and Bethel mm -hmm. mm. And um, I mean, it was rough, real rough back then. You know, growing up. In, in Brooklyn at that time, in the 90s, early 90s, it was a major drug era. Yes. You know, that's when the crack era came in. I mean, it hit hard in New York. It hit hard at that time for us. You know, we were young. Um, most of all my friends I grew up with and was around, um, parents was either caught in, you know, involved with the situation, being a victim of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that some parents, you know, got caught up into the movement and the hustle of the game. And um, it either made some of the young men stronger or, or, you know, they fell behind circumstances of what happened to their parents at that time. Yeah. You know? Mm. Yeah. But, Bro but Brooklyn changed a lot now. So that's 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 um, a big up for us yeah. out there. Yeah, know? I heard it's, uh, it's gentrified now. I, I guess that's the term to use. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I heard it's not nothing like when, when you guys were growing up. Um, oh, no, nah, not at all. <laughs> For, for people who, who who don't know, who are some of the um, the rappers that came out of the Brownsville section, or you know specifically where you're from? Um, well, I'm from. I mean, you can go all the way back to the um, basically Brooklyn alone. Uh, you know, we had a lot of upcoming artists from Brooklyn, from um, Jay Wood, Damager, Big Daddy Kane, and um, uh, you know, all the way up Smith and Weston, Black Moon, yeah. and Brownsville. Basically, Black Moon and Smith and Weston was like one of the major groups that kind of put the uh, Brownsville on the map for us mm -hmm. up there, you know. And um, then while Smooth was re um, recording his project, him and DR period, was working heavy together. Um, he was going to be kind of like the next artist dropping at that time, but the situation happened, so mm -hmm. MOP became the next group yeah. out of out of Brooklyn, which um, DR period started producing after Smooth's situation. And then once Smooth um, returned, Basically, he was get, able to drop again. So, um, but from our Brownsville area, we we kind of worked with so many different artists because even Foxy Brown, she's not from Brownsville, but she was a part of our camp mm -hmm. when she was thirteen years old. Me and Smooth kind of molded her to become that artist, you know. So once she was able to get to Def Jam and those places like that, she was able to do her thing, you know. And then um, also we worked with. Um, Artists like Papoose, we have Papoose, he was a part right. of Man Smooth team also, you know, mm. and um, I mean, a lot of artists, D.V. Elias Christ, also, you know, that's, that's our other partner. Yeah, man. With Man Smooth. Yeah. D.V. Elias Christ, real quick, because I, I definitely, we, we got to touch on him. Um, this is how we saw him, I'm in L.A., this is how we kind of saw him, we saw him as kind of an East Coast version of Nate Dogg, would that, would that kind of, would that be an accurate Yeah. Portrayal? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, like, me and Christ, me and Christ was best friends since we was in junior high school. Um, and and Christ always was singing since he was younger than that. You know, when he was in public school, he was singing. I've, I've known about him and his family. His mom was a, a singer back in the days in, in New York. She had records out and stuff like that. 
and um and her name was Claudette Polite, and she was doing real good at the time. We were real young, and when we got into junior high school, me and DVL is Christ. I, I was I was running um a dance group at the time when I was in junior high school. And that's how me and DVL is Christ met through the dance group, just personally, me and him, and we became real close. And we started our own dance group in New York called the Guest Riders, um, which turned out we, we went all around the world, number one everywhere that we wound up being a special guest at Apollo. And that's from that point, Smooth has stopped um, moving around with the guest rod as far as dancing and stuff like that. And he went straight back into his music. And from that point on, that's how we you know, became Smooth the Hustle and Trigger the Gambler, DVL is Christ. Now, I was going to mention Foxy Brown later, but uh, since you brought her up, um, how did that relationship start? And is there any, um, uh, Smooth wrote, wrote that verse for Ain't No Nigga, is that correct? Well, Smooth wrote basically everything for Foxy when she was a young girl. Um, there was nothing that Smooth didn't have his hands on or involved with when it came to Foxy. Um, Smooth was basically the, the startup of her whole career when it came to her even getting her first deal on, I think it was Capitol Records, if I'm not mistaken. She had a deal on Capitol Records. It was real short. We got our budget and stuff like that to the next level. And um, basically her mom stepped in because she was young and her moms came in and took over the project. And when her moms came and took over the project, you know, that went left field. And then at the same time, a smooth still, because Foxy was our homegirl, you know, she was young, she was our homegirl. She used to hang around us all the time. And, um, and so smooth looked at her as a little sister. He didn't look at her far as the business side of it at that time. Because, you know, when you're being young, you just want your entourage to be the best. Mm -hmm. And um, Smooth was the first one out of our whole entourage that got focused on the um, music um, tip and writing and stuff like that. And he was the one bringing every last one of us to the table to help us in that field, to make sure we was doing the music correctly, make sure we was writing and the stuff that we was talking about was solid. So Smooth kind of molded everything with that. And the relationship, when it got to Def Jam, she was in the hands of other people at that time, and it was just, it was a bitter situation because when Smooth album had dropped, um, her and Smooth would have songs together and stuff like that. She was supposed to be on a Smooth album, the Once Upon a Time in America album, but because of the business side of it and the technicalities that went on between her management and Smooth management, it basically didn't take place at that moment. Um, because she was getting signed to Def Jam and Smooth was on Profile and at that time Profile and Def Jam didn't have the best relationship at all. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so around the time that I was able to get signed to Def Jam is when we built that relationship between Def Jam and Profile. Okay. Damn, okay. Yeah. Now, now yeah. Um, let, let's, we're, we're going to bounce around a bit. Um, you, were, you were signed, now correct me if I'm wrong, you guys were signed to Tommy Boy? Uh, yeah, well, Tommy Boy came. Tommy Boy came last. Ah. Um, yeah, Tommy Boy was the last deal that me and Smooth had um, signed to, and we signed a Tommy Boy together as the Smith Brothers. Mm. And um, the Def Jam deal, what it was, was I was signed to Dante Ross, which was no doubt entertainment at at Def Jam. Okay. And it was um, what happened was. A lot of people always thought my album got shelved at Def Jam. My, al my album never got shelved. I pulled my album from Def Jam. Really? The, the, um, yeah. Um, what happened was I was under No Doubt Entertainment, which was Dante Ross. And as an A&R, being an A&R for an artist at a record label, you suspect your A&R to be a part of what you're doing right next to you. You know, basically at those times, the A&R was the middleman. You needed your A&R. You know, and um, basically my A&R never came to not a session that I ever had when I was on Def Jam. So I knew from that moment he was he was just scared of the movement of my team. My team was a street team and, you know, we, we moved like that. And that's how we move. And I just under, I understood that he was a kind of scared individual. He will always complain about the entourage I would have in my studio sessions, but my studio sessions was being knocked out in nine and ten days. The whole album was done. Yeah. So um, my album was uh, um, submitted to Def Jam almost three to four months before my date, my submission date. 
Mm. So my album was then submitted and handed into Def Jam. Def, Def Jam had approved the album. And what happened was when Dante Ross got caught doing some money move maneuvering what? between D.V. Elias Christ <clears throat> budget. And you know, I got D.V. Elias Christ a deal at Def Jam, a copycat deal. So he had a deal before he was um, able to even drop a record on Def Jam. Christ had a deal. So what happened was when I caught the situation, I went straight to Russell and Leon like, what's going to happen from this? Because I'm not going forward knowing that I'm dealing with individuals that like to put their hand in the pot they're not supposed to. So when I went to Russell, Russell said, listen, let's move on with it for a second and we can figure it out. Give us a month or two to figure it out. Me as a, me as a man first, I know business. So me, I told them, no, it's not going to happen. Either you're going to get rid of him and revamp the budget that he took, some of the money that he, he messed with, mm -hmm. um, revamp that, and pull me directly on Def Jam, then we can continue to talk. So what happened was they did that. They they stopped the project for Dante Ward and pulled me directly on Def Jam and revamped my budget again. So mm -hmm. I was able to move around and do new music, which was with different production, Noontime Entertainment, that was in Atlanta at the time, Tone and Pope, you know, they're out in New York. Um, I was working with Clark Kent, a whole bunch of different big, big producers, you know, and uh, Pete Rock and this, you know, a couple of other guys. And um, basically, at that moment, it was a lot of stuff going on at Death Jam. Because I was under No Doubt Entertainment, which was Dante Ross. And as an A&R, being an A&R for an artist at a record label, you suspect your A&R to be a part of what you're doing right next to you. You know, basically at those times, the A&R was the middleman. You needed your A&R, mm -hmm. you know? And um, basically my A&R never came to not a session that I ever had when I was on Def Jam. So I knew from that moment, he was, he was just scared of the movement of my team. My team was a street team and you know, we, we move like that, and that's how we move. And I just under, I understood that he was a kind of scared individual. He would always complain about the entourage I would have in my studio sessions, but my studio sessions was being knocked out in nine and ten days. The whole album was done. Mm. So um, my album was uh, um, submitted to Def Jam almost three to four months before my date, my submission date. So my album was then submitted and handed into Def Jam. Def, Def Jam had approved the album. And what happened was when Dante Ross got caught doing some money move maneuvering what? between D.V. Elias Christ budget. And you know, I got D.V. Elias Christ a deal at Def Jam, a copycat deal. So he had a deal before he was um, able to even drop a record on Def Jam. Christ had a deal. So what happened was when I caught the situation, I went straight to Russell and Leon like, what's going to happen from this? Because I'm not going forward knowing that I'm dealing with individuals that like to put their hand in the pot they're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Russell, Russell said, listen, let's move on with it for a second and we can figure it out. Give us a month or two to figure it out. Me as a, me as a man first, I know business. So me, I told them, no, it's not going to happen. Either you're going to get rid of him and revamp the budget that he took, some of the money that he, he messed with, mm -hmm. um, revamp that, and pull me directly on Def Jam, then we can continue to talk. So what happened was they did that. They they stopped the project for Dante Ward and pull me directly on Def Jam and revamp my budget again. So mm -hmm. I was able to move around and do new music, which was with different production, Noontime Entertainment that was in Atlanta at the time, Tone and Pope, you know, they're out in New York. Um, I was working with Clark Kent, a whole bunch of different big, big producers, you know, and uh, Pete Rock and this, you know, a couple of other guys. And um, basically, at that moment, it was a lot of stuff going on at Def Jam. Hmm. And so, I don't, I don't really so? want to put... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to put so much of Def Jam situation now, but Def Jam, they was doing a lot of emerging at that time. It was getting rid of a lot of people and and I was a major artist there that kept a lot of A&Rs up there because I used to sit at the table when they was going to get rid of the Herb Gotties and, the, and, and all of the different um, entities that was there before any of the bull crap happened with any of them. 
And I used to sit up there and say, how can you get rid of these entertainment groups that's here at y'all label when y'all have no one else? You got rid of Jam Master J, Jam JMJ yeah. Records that was yeah. with Onyx and everybody. So I used to ask them questions like that because I was the only artist at Def Jam that controlled my own budget. Even though I had an a, 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 I still controlled my own budget. We, we produced our own music. And, and we brought all the artists to the table. And I was doing artist development for Def Jam for DMX. And just a lot of different artists that came up there. They had me going to the studio, filling them out, working okay. with them, doing things like that. So Def Jam, I was getting paid doing artist development for a lot of artists that was coming through the door of Def Jam at that time. But see... Me, personally, I started realizing the business side of what was going on with the emerges and things like that with the violators, the Chris Lighties, the, you know, and, and, and at those times, let me just keep it real. A lot of those guys, you know, they were, they were hating. Ah. They were hating. They didn't want to see me be successful at Def Jam, the type of deal that I had at Def Jam. I would have been the first artist at Def Jam to really control all my masters and everything and get the splits the way are supposed to get split. You understand what I'm saying? And because they knew, because so many different people up there knew that we was the first entity, Next Level was the first entity to have five major artists, five artists signed to five major deals, and we were the first ones doing it. And all the guys would come to us, the Run DMCs, the, the Puff Daddy. The um the um the game dash, all of them would come to us and sit down and get the game, get the game on how how to get the money from these record labels and and how to do that. And you know, our management was Rafiq and um Next Level Entertainment, which was Final Level. We we basically had open arms to a lot of artists, so we shared the game to a lot of artists for them to get in the game at that time and understand that you can get budgets from these record labels and don't have to give it all up. Mm. And still get your publishing and own your publishing, and still when they when they breach, you're able to walk away with your masters. So we were trying to give them the game then. Mm. But do you know you know when you're giving somebody the real true game? Mm. A lot of times when you have ass kisses and people that kiss ass, they go back. behind your back and, and tell the oh, company yeah. what you're doing. Oh yeah, you understand what I'm saying? So me personally, I started reading between the lines on just the movement. Of the company itself. And I, I started going back to my team like, look, I, I know Def Jam is a top label. It's one of the best labels. But right now, I'm not nobody's gopher and I'm not nobody's puppet. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to be doing the things that they asked me to do for them. And they don't do the same to, to, in return, basically. Yeah. Because we're partners in this. I'm not an artist signed directly to them. I was under the next level, which was our own production. So it was the company that was signed to Def Jam. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so basically, the way we tried to maneuver the business side up there, it just started getting a little shaky because these, you know, these guys don't want you to know and understand the game at an early age. That was my first year up there with one of the best deals ever, and I was one of the ones that negotiated the deal. What year so, are we talking? We talking '96. Okay. Okay. You know, so 96, we was negotiating our own deals and Smooth had just came in the game in 95. Mm. So, so the record label, they was looking like, whoa, wait a minute. These guys know a little too much yeah. more than, <laughs> you know, what they're supposed to. I want to I want to take it back um, to, to like around 96, you know, the 95, 96 sure. era um, when you guys were really, really, you know, popping and, and, you know, things started getting hot for you. It was a weird year in hip hop. You know, we lost Tupac. The rapper and actor Tupac Shakur is dead at the age of 25, just about a week after sustaining four bullet wounds last Saturday night in Las Vegas. Um, six six months later, we lost Biggie. 24-year-old rap artist known as Notorious B.I.G., Christopher Wallace, was shot early Sunday morning and later died of gunshot wounds at nearby Cedar sinai Medical Center. Um, take me back to that time and, and what was the environment oh, like? How was it? To, you know, talk to me about that. Man, oh man, that... Well, you know, basically, in the early 90s, me and Smooth, you know, we, we used to run into Pac a lot. Um, and running to, you know, Big was real close with us from the door anyway, just from us in Brooklyn and being about 
about six blocks away from each other growing up. Um, so we always had a relationship. The thing that got me the most, and I never spoke on it in 20 years. I never spoke on this topic. I never spoke to no other um, radio station, no one about this. About this, you are the first one. Thank you. I'm giving this information to and how I felt about it. Um, Biggie and Pop was best friends. That I think people didn't really understand how tight they were. Let me see how I'm gonna hit you with. You wanna set it off? Yeah, I'm scared to do some freestyle. I'm scared to do some freestyle. Bro, I'm too high and I might go off tempo. Way beyond the music. These brothers were very, very close. When you when when you can have someone meet you at a train station in Brooklyn and little C's and an entourage pick you up from Brooklyn, you know, and bring you to the house and the love you have out there was amazing. People wouldn't understand the love that them two individuals had when they would just stand next to each other around people and the the, the excitement that they would bring. Now, the entourages of those individuals were street individuals, period. Right. It was street individuals. And all of those individuals that was involved were individuals each party knew. Each party knew. And the thing that got me the most, and I'm going to keep it real with you, the thing that got me the most is that they knew and everybody knew who did it in New York and that Biggie ain't have nothing to do with it. Everybody knew that. Wow, if you were from the streets, if you was from the streets out here and you was in the mix, you knew who the fuck did it. Excuse my language, but mm -hmm. you knew. Mm -hmm. And the thing that got me is the people that was ahead of those brothers that was, that was in the forefront of them, like Puffy and Suge. You telling me them, them two brothers with that much money and that much pull in the street, they ain't know, they ain't know the real deal? They knew the real deal. Mm. But then they wanted to they wanted to, they wanted Pop to continue to go on with the with the with the bull crap for the record sales. And I'ma tell you something. It was and I understand that some of the individuals that was around my G, they really was feeling where he was coming from because a lot of them thought that big did have something to do with it and and Pac was redirected in those conversations because the real OGs that was around him knew the real deal mm. so so the thing that gets me the most is that me and Smooth was back and forth in LA at that time that was going on mm -hmm. because I see like I said is our OG that's our homie mm -hmm. so we're in LA back and forth with Ice T where's the hate for New York it was no hate it was no hate. We was in the Long Beaches, yeah, in the Crenshaw. Yeah, we didn't hate you. You know guys. what I'm saying? Right. I was in Corona Hills. I was in Beverly Hills. I was all out there. So the love I was getting in L.A., I was shouting that back to New York. Like, yo, don't listen to the radio stations. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to this. Yo, L.A. is going to always be our other home. Mm. So, so individuals that understood it, they knew. Okay, it ain't no beef, and it ain't. We don't. We ain't got no. And look, Brooklyn didn't have no kind of vibe against LA, even when the bullcrap of they was doing songs back and forth because everybody thought Biggie's song "Who Shot You" was to Tupac, and yeah. it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't. Can't even lie. Okay? can't even lie. I thought that too. Being out in LA, we thought that. <laughs> But, but it wasn't. It was a song that was done way before the incident happened. And only Brooklyn rappers that was in the mix that was either number one at the time, like me and Smooth, or was in the mix of us doing music and tours with all of us, they were stopping the D&D studios, and they were stopping the NC Biggie um, uh, recording his songs or Big Pun in the other room recording his songs and stuff like that. So we knew the songs was being done months and months, almost a year before the shit even happened. Mm. But when it happened and you got record, record execs that control that movement, 
Of course they're going to try to take the best record of artists got and run with it and try to throw it out there and make it seem like, oh, well, this is, you know, he's going to defend himself with this. Yeah. You know, just like this right here is going to make him look good. But that wasn't big thing. Big had been said from day one. Yo, y'all, I ain't even getting involved with this shit, man. Look, Pac, my nigga, I'm going to let him vent. We'll be able to talk. Mm. They want to know the real shit on all that uh, shit that's been going on. You know how y'all really feel about what's that going on. I look at this shit like this, man. We all trying to be rich niggas, man. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. That man doing what he got to do, and I'm going to do what I got to do. You know what right. I'm saying? Right. Plain and simple. When we see each other, we going to see each other. That was big words all the way to the day he got shot. Okay? Mm. So it was never no drama from his end. Never. So, it's, to me, it's way bigger than what people can imagine. Now, since Pac and Big gone, everybody wanted to blame the shit on them two. Oh, they did this. Pac did this. Big did this. They, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. Mm. Let's keep it real. This game is a money game. That's what it's about. It's a money game. Mm. And to the fans out there that don't understand, this is a money game. Period. Any way you can make a dollar as an exec and you are the artist, they're going to exploit you. No disrespect, but it's just like a, a hoe on a strip. If you want to allow them to keep pimping you, they're going to pimp you. You know it's hard out here for a pimp when you're trying to get the money for the rent. It's what it is. And then you got to, people got to understand, look back at just the game itself. Look who controlled it, the five Jews. Yeah, right. yeah, my name. You understand what I'm saying? And then they go get the, the, the let me keep it real, the black, white, hope. They go get one for every city. And he goes and enslaves all these different young artists into the music business, but never show them the real side of the business. Sweet. Never teach them the game. Don't do nothing to them. They just there to suck them dry. They leech it. That's why they still living and surviving in this game. Mm. Because as long as you could be a blood sucker for the industry and suck the, the life out of half of these artists and individuals, and you're making that money, they'll keep providing you. 10 and 20 million ain't shit to them when you're selling a million records for the price of $15.99, yeah. $16.99. Do the math. Do the math, and then when 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 the artist is gone or passed away, these labels got life insurance on you. They got all type of shit on you. That, that at the end of the day, these, these labels gonna continue to make billions of dollars off of each artist, not no yes. millions. You think Man. you see the difference between us here is that they make you think, oh, you gotta go platinum, you gotta sell a million records to make money. That's what they mm. make you think. And hell no, because when I used to go to the UK in 90 fucking six, you could go sell 200, 300,000 and be a multi-millionaire. And I saw that from the artists out there. So here it is. They make you think that you got so much, you got to, oh, you got to go platinum. And if you don't go platinum, then you ain't worth it. No, the only reason why they set the bar for platinum is because of the certain amount of money that they, they get out that first year from being from going mm -hmm. platinum. Yep. If they can make, if they can go three years of you going platinum without you realizing the type of money you're making for that label, shit, they set for the next 15, 20 years mm. that they can take, they can take chances on 50 or 200 other artists without you now. Mm. But if they got a name popping, do you think it's going to take them 50 artists to get another artist popping? No. So now it takes, it's, it's easier for them to go, I got 10 artists. This, these three went platinum. Now I got enough for the, the, the other seven. Mm -hmm. I could get them a million dollar budget if I wanted to. Yep. You see? And see, like, an artists that came in the game, this is what people got to understand. A lot of artists only last and survived in the game is the artist who they gave the most money to at those times. And when you got people, you got groups like, entities like Cash Money, how can you lose when you got a record label, a company that gave you $30, 40000000 million from the door? How can you lose? You can't lose. You can't lose. 
You can't lose from that. When you got a company that gave Jay-Z 30, 40 million to start, how can you lose? Mm -hmm. You can't lose. If you a hustler and you somebody that know how to, man, come on, man. These guys used to flip $5,000 to $50,000. So giving them $40 million, what do you think they're going to do if they're smart? Uh, they're going to they gonna kill the game with it. There you go. But then you also got these guys that's going to accept that money that's also going also to take that oath. And that oath is not to give the game to the next individuals unless they lock uh, in. Uh. You understand? The, Either you lock in or you locked out. The game is to be sold, not to be told. Be told. And I'm the type of individual that I'm not just one of them dudes, man. I, I don't, I'm not a follower. I'm a leader. I've always been a leader all my life, no matter what situation I've ever been in. And money don't define me as a man. And money don't change me. Money never changed me. Any individual that know me, know I never had a big head, never been big headed to the industry. I never worried about any materialistic stuff in this industry. I've always worried about an individuals' well-being and if are they getting treated fair mm -hmm. in the music business because you're giving your life out there to people. You're explaining your life to the world. You know, and some people like this, um, uh, um, you know, now they got the live television, you know, you on there, everything now is just reality TV and all this yeah. stuff. But come to the reality of life. The reality is, is that you're selling an illusion to this TV because people know once the camera come on, everything changes. Yeah. You know, you do stuff differently turn when the camera is in front of you. Yeah. yeah, you turn it up a little bit. You're never going to be yourself. So it's an illusion for people to 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 get the wrong perception of artists. And this is why artists get looked at the way they get looked at. This is why some of these young individuals now run around here and think that you got to check in. Check in to what? Mm. Okay. Check, this is check, in, check into what? When you, when, when you tell me that to check in somewhere, you better be paying for everything that's involved with me. Then you, then you got my attention. You got smooth attention. Yep, yep. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't care about a dollar. I wouldn't care what your reputation is. None of that. Because none of that ever moved me in Brooklyn, ever moved me and my brother in this whole industry, everywhere we went around the world. Check in where? Yeah, yeah. It's a silly, silly concept. When Takashi got robbed, my mom... My boy, my big homie Ice T called me and asked me what I thought of it. Huh. And and to be honest with you, I told him right from the door it's his own team. Mm. And the reason why is because Brooklyn has a code. Okay? And Takashi is too young for him to understand that code. But his team is not. You understand? And that code out there is is a chain of command. If you end with that circle and you violate in that circle, if you never got violated before and you leave that circle and all of a sudden you got violated, who the hell you think did it? If if your team is strong enough for you not to get violated the whole time you whooped them, then you get violated when you ain't with them, he should have used his own mind behind that. You understand? Because that's how Brooklyn moved. I mean, we are so... Brooklyn guys grew up together for babies. That's how Brooklyn moves. If you got a team in Brooklyn, nine times out of ten, y'all been together since y'all was children. So you can't come in between that. The new, the new outside comer that's coming in, he got a thin line. You'll ne you'll never be as tight as the brothers that been growing up together with each other, unless you show and prove that. That loyalty. Now, Takashi was young. He's young. Mm -hmm. So, let me show y'all this. From a young guy's point of view, when you coming into any game and you making that type of money, you don't really know about the streets. So, you only going to listen to what your OGs tell you. You only going to follow what 
they tell you he a young kid around grown men yeah. that's telling him, yo, do this, yo, do why? Because it's about the dollar, it's about the money. Mm-hmm. And when you understand the hustle as an exec, and the Takisha, he's the he's the artist, he's the whole on the string, they gonna suck him dry and make the money that they need to make off of him. Yeah. And move on. But it, and move on, but if he become that in-house family to them, that loyalty behind it, they would have stuck behind him all the way and none of that would have never happened to him. So he had to do something across mm. Treyway in some loyal. kind of way. He wasn't loyal somewhere. Yeah. And that's what messed him up. But I also feel like him knowing right from wrong, he played the part in it also because he know you don't antagonize. You don't. You don't go at street individuals and call out gang members and disrespect LA. The love that I have for LA, period, made me mad on just hearing him say anything or anything about anybody out there. Because I have the love for New York the same way I have the love for LA. You understand? Regardless of what, I have lived both places. A lot of people just don't know that. You know, I'm yeah. just one of the individuals. I live in L.A. for seven, eight years. Nobody would never yeah. know because I'm in a cut somewhere. Yeah. You know? But that's how it is. And, and, and when you have two different homes, you have the love from both. You give the love back. There's no need for me to be in the East Coast talking about the West Coast or disrespecting the West Coast. I ain't got nothing but love. In the, 90, in, in the early 90s, I ain't did nothing but hung with uh, uh, corrupting them and dads and them yeah. and, and rat Any of them that came to New York, we all got together and chilled and, and hung, went up in the clubs with each other and stuff like that. And it's then vice versa, you know? So it was always love between Brooklyn and, and, and L.A. Because of Brooklyn and Compton, we always did songs. We got we got a Brooklyn and Compton song out and all that between us and Ice and everybody, you know? So there's a lot of things we try to do to keep that love and, and, and respect going back and forth with both coasts. But when you have the media that don't give two dams about neither coast when it mm-hmm. comes to individuals. They just they want don't to sell care. magazines. They want to sell magazines. It's money. They're going to keep the controversy going. And then you got the ignorant MCs that feed into that and don't understand what these companies are doing. So they feed into it and throw the bullshit out there. Mm-hmm. My thing, personally, I don't want to see no beef between no artists. I want to see the beef between the record. Yeah. Let the record be hot enough that both records it's like you think the record is war- warring with each other. Not the individual. Because it gets deeper than that after y'all beef, after the lights is off, after the cameras is off. You feel that yep. what that next person said about you. Beef now is you 24-7. Got your children, yeah. You got your children you got to turn around and look to. Mm-hmm. You got your wife or something you got to look to. You're not thinking about their feelings when they go out there out in the public and people got to keep coming to them and asking them questions and your yeah. children, they asking them questions. And, you know, sometimes when you, we chose to put ourselves in it, not our family. Mm-hmm. So we have to use our head and be smarter not to do the ignorant and dumb stuff that caused the chain reaction because it's deeper than ourselves. You know, and, and that's more what it is. Now, music, no matter if it's gangster rap, conscious music, whatever, it's to each his own. The whole purpose of us as being artists is we are painters. We paint the picture of the hood, of our community. We are there to spread those words, that knowledge, that information, no matter if it's, it might sound harsh when you're talking to drugs or talking to street life, but this is what these young guys experience. You know, it's what they experience, what they seen. If they seen different, they would talk different. They would talk about things differently, but they haven't seen it. Now, as they get older, they will start seeing more things. Why? Because they might be traveling more, exploring more, and the mind will more and more will open up, and they were able, they would be able to see past the illusion and the, and the dimensions that they have us in. Mm. And so, once they understand that, they would know, okay. Let me go back to reality because there is a such thing as a reality, you know, and 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 that's what people lost. And we gain that back. And I always tell my brother this. I say, man, 80 percent of fans are now artists. So it's hard. <laughs> exactly. To really, it's, it's hard to have fans again. You understand what I'm saying? That's so it's, true, homie. Oh, my you know? God. Yeah, it's just the whole thing. It's like you got to. 
you gotta know what to do now in this type of industry. Yeah. And I'm still like this. A lot of people ask me about mumble rappers and this and that. They gotta remember this. One of the first biggest rap records that came into the industry was rapping Duke. Hard to hard. Never thought the hip hop would right. take it this far. Would yeah. take it this far. Yeah. Yeah. Like, who would have ever thought that? Uh, 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 who would have thought that would have ever thought uh, uh, Yeah, uh, right? Like, so, so when you listen to these young artists that's only trying to spit what they know, they're only trying to give us music that they're comfortable mm -hmm. with. And as us being an older generation, of course, we ain't gonna be so fast and comfortable with it because we're stuck in our ways. We are comfortable with what we love and what we know already. You understand? But don't take away from the young generation that's trying to do something. And I can understand that this generation might be talking about pill popping and stuff and using it. And our generation was talking about selling it and what we seen. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, it goes back to what what you lived in at that moment. These young kids haven't seen the real hustle of the the drug game, the killings, the the things that came out of that. What they see from it is the after effect of the drug parents' children, yep. the, the, the the children that parents was on drugs. They yep. see that these kids now is okay with the drug. It's a different, but teach them how to get away from it. Damn. Teach them how, teach them how to work around that, and let them know that it's a bigger picture, and it's a bigger picture than popping pills or talking about drugs or whatever. And give them guidance. If we keep bashing them and always saying, "Oh, they mumble rappers, they ain't this, they that," or you know, then all we doing is destroying our youth. We ain't, we ain't building them by destroying them like that. That's not building them. You understand? We gotta, we gotta educate them. Show them how, and because look, at this day of time, they are educating the older generation. You know why? Because they doing this shit independently, and they making their money from you. it. Thank you. Thank you. And in their own way, they, they are They cut out the middleman. They cut out the middleman. They cut the middleman. Uh. And, 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 that, and, and why, and how come the artists back then couldn't do that? Because we wasn't smart enough to Thank cut the middleman. You. We was more into the materialistic shit that came with the game. And period, that's what a lot of artists were stuck in at those moments back then. These artists don't care about that. They are, to me, they are truly attached to the music, just like we was in the 90s and our fans were. Thank you for saying that. You know what I'm saying? They're dedicated. They are very dedicated to the artists that they love and, and stuff like that. Look, Just look at the following. Look at how they're able to get yeah. 20 million and 10 yes. million hits and stuff like yeah. that and make the money from it. Yeah, man. Record labels, record labels wasn't even doing that. Thank so at you. the end of the day, at the end of the day, we got to stop. And this is for all older MCs and artists Preach. out there. Stop Tell them, dog. Bashing. Please, Thank man. You. Stop bashing these young brothers, man, because in Thank the next you. 10, 15 years, these young brothers are going to show all, a lot of different artists how to basically own your label. You. So that's what's going to happen. It's going to turn from the distribution to owning your own distribution label company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because this is how big it's going to get bigger and bigger. It's not going to get smaller. So, so my, my truth for the older dudes, man, come on, y'all. Support these brothers, man, and, and help them and show them what direction just show them what you might want to listen to that's all because it ain't nothing but to uh, make a decision they look y'all give them a seed plant a seed in their head hey y'all talk about some of this hey we want to hear something about some young ladies or some real stuff that's going on or we want to hear this get feed it to them maybe they'll go back to the studio and go you know what i'm gonna try that let me try that and give that to my fan base mm -hmm. or a new fan base that i'm trying to gain let me give that to them and that's the true back to the younger artists. Take heed into what some of the guys say, but if they bashing you, uh, just ignore it and move on. But take some of the jewels that you can take from it because you'll last longer. And that's one thing about the old school artists, the knowledge that they can give these younger guys how to last in the game, how to last for 20 years, how to last for 30 years. They can be taught that while the younger generation can teach the older generation how to cut the middleman out.
Period. Dude, thank you so much for saying that. That's that's a perfect ending. It didn't get any better than that, and you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to drop those jewels. I really appreciate you doing that, man, because I'm no forty. Doubt, I'm, I'm forty one years old, and even though I don't understand the little Uzi verts and the little pumps and the little whatevers, uh, right. once again, you have to respect what they're doing and and learn from them. And it goes both ways. Respect the younger generation, then the younger generation will respect you. Will respect. Thank yes, you, brother. Trigger. Yes. Um, where can we find you, my man? Uh, listen, man, you can check me out. I'm on Facebook under Trigger the Gambler. You can go to my Instagram. It's the same, Trigger the Gambler. Um, Trigger SMG. Um, you can go there. My email, if anybody want to email me or anything like that, is save my generation, TG at gmail.com. Or you can hit me up, Trigger the Gambler, SMG at yahoo.com. 